like standing in the cemetery waiting by the graveside for the hearse to pull up and a voice comes from the grave and says, good morning, Father, and I jumped. It was the grave digger in the grave. I hadn't noticed him. I said, I'm very sorry. I've never seen a resurrection. I'm getting nervous. Uh, that's not hyperbole. That really happened. But the gospel, Jesus overstates the fact. He's calling us to goodness and holiness, and it's a tall order. It's a new ethic for us, and it's challenging for us. There's a shorter version that you can read, you know, like if you have reservations at six. Um, but why not? Why skip over? We don't skip over parts of God's good news. But our call is a call to pray and not to judge. We can think of people in all sorts of relationships that make all sorts of mistakes. We're not here to judge. We're here to answer the call begun at baptism. You're here because somebody in your life worked hard at religion, and it can't be taken for granted, certainly in our communities, because people aren't as religious as they used to be. It's not a, a, a Christian society anymore. It's a diverse society. Um, we looked at the stats this past week over the religious makeup of South Windsor. 50% of people uh, subscribe to some religion, uh, whether mostly Christian, uh, many Jews and a large contingent of Buddhists and some Muslims that worship out of town, but 50% of the town subscribes to nothing at all, which means we have work to do. You're here because at some point someone expressed religious faith in your home. But then you read these readings, such as the Gospel, and you're not quite sure how to handle it. How do I bring this news and still call it good news? You're here because you experience different generations living out the faith. It wasn't just for older people. It wasn't just for younger people with rites of passage. It was for a mix of people. And it made you believe. You're here because someone involved you in some type of leadership role, whether it was your turn to say grace at the table, uh, your turn somehow to live out the faith. You're here because you've been involved in living out the faith and not just for this 45 minutes or so on a Saturday evening or Sunday morning. You're here because you thirst for God. If you happen to um, deal with the doctor and he says, oh, you're dehydrated. Well, I didn't know. Well, something physiologically, you don't know that you're thirsty until way after you need to have that glass of water. We don't know that you thirst for God until all of a sudden you're in a crisis unless You've been exposed to faith. You see, these people have meaning in their lives. These aunts and uncles and cousins and relatives and neighbors, they're good people. I want goodness. What motivates them? What's the experience they have? Where do they find their joy? Some people are exposed to that. They don't know that they're thirsty for God. A good coach or a good doctor or a good trainer will say to you, okay, now hydrate, hydrate. But who says to you, okay, pray, pray. Maybe when you are little, your grandmother said, now kneel down and say your prayers, and she stood there. You did it wrong. Do it again. Why are you blessing yourself that way? What are you doing? Say your prayers. And they it was really, you know, an ordeal just to get, you know, the ice cream after. But someone showed you what? With training wheels, what to do first. You know when you first join a gym and they give you that complimentary uh, thing where they show you just how bad shape you are in, and, and they go through these different exercises, but after a while you get good at it. And you're, you're more impressed than anyone else. But you have been nourished by family and by friends, and so here you are. You're spiritually mature to take the difficult words of both St. Paul and the prophet Sirach and the gospel writer Matthew. To take those and say, okay, these are challenging, but you're ready for a challenge. So I'll give you a quick challenge this evening. Uh, look around, see some of you don't know. There's plenty to choose from. Now ask that person their name. You have five seconds. One, two, three. Okay, now, here's the challenge. 
first, remember the name. <laughs> and then secondly, pray for that person throughout the rest of this mess. We all come with tensions and things that we're worried about and things that distract us, but pray for that stranger among you. That's the hardest thing, I think, for New England Christians to do, because we have good fences, makes good neighbors, and we're afraid to reach out, but what makes a parish, what makes a family is that you know someone that's practicing their faith. You've just met someone that is here because they've experienced God and their thirst has been quenched. You now play part and parcel of helping them quench that thirst once again because to enact your faith is to come to a deeper belief, to come to spiritual maturity and to be satisfied.